in April 1975, a gang of top criminals entered the Bank of America in London's exclusive Mayfair, dressed as smart businessmen. They raided the bank's safety deposit boxes and stole an astonishing eight million pounds worth of cash, jewels, and high-value items. Anything in excess of a million pounds in those days, hell of a lot of money, hell of a lot of money. Or oh, once a robbery produces a tremendous amount of headlines, there is a great deal of demand from the bosses of the Met to ensure that the robbers are caught. It was just a race to get to the criminals who may well have done this robbery. This is the audacious story of how a criminal gang robbed one of the world's biggest banks and carried out one of Britain's biggest heists. Son. Don't make any mistake about this. If we do this the hard way, you're going away for 18 years. What do you want to know? What would I do? The best thing you can do is start from the beginning and tell me exactly what went down. Twenty-six-year-old convict Stuart Buckley was serving a nine-month prison sentence for handling stolen goods. He was a fastidious individual. He paid great attention to detail. His cell was kept immaculate. Um, everything was had its place, and he, and he made sure it was kept clean. He was quite a nice kid. Easy to talk to, a nice sort of guy. In my book, an idiot who got a little bit over-ambitious. Yeah, he was just a crafty little criminal, really. He wasn't a big-time criminal. He, he had the ability to work. I've got to say, he had a criminal mind. Um, I think that's what gave him the thrills, uh, that he's involved with it. Um, he was an interesting little character. He had some history of small-time crime, handling stolen goods, but small-time fraud as well. And I think he'd been in jail about twice. I don't think he could read or write, but he was quite a genius with electricals, phones, etc. After his release from prison, Stuart Buckley was hoping to use his electrical experience to gain employment. Well, he was a man that wasn't a trained electrician. He hadn't done an apprenticeship, so there wasn't any electrical job he couldn't do. One or two of the crimes we investigated found out that he'd been able to manipulate phones, bypass phones, intercept phones, and uh, yeah, for a man of his background, he was very good at it. Responding to a job vacancy, Buckley had secured an electrician's post at the Bank of America in London's Mayfair. The Bank of America was based in probably one of the most affluent areas of London, where diplomats are based, so it would have been used by envoys, diplomatic corps people, and probably as well Far Eastern businessmen who, who have vast amounts of money and want to have stored it somewhere safe. The Bank of America is one of the world's largest banking institutes. In the 1970s, they had nine branches situated in London. One of their branches was on Davies Street in Mayfair, where Stuart Buckley was now working. It was a lovely old building with a vault, as most banks have. And obviously, because of its situation, I would imagine quite a busy bank. And at that time, they had problems with um, getting the proper phones that they needed for the bank. And he was able to get them all through the back door, and he did all the phones in the bank. They'd have to wait six months, Americans, get it, got a chance of getting it done tomorrow, get it done. They didn't ask any further who's doing it. Alarmingly for a bank, the officials had failed to carry out any background checks on Stuart Buckley before employing him. Because he was the general handyman used for 
not employed permanently, but uh, casual on a cash basis, I take it. They just accepted him without ever inquiring or vetting who he was. He's doing a good job, I'm pleased to say. As an electrician, he was in a situation whereby they trusted him. He was obviously appeared very loyal. With the successful completion of each job, Buckley was entrusted the keys to most of the London branches of the bank, including one on Davies Street and three miles away on Cannon Street. He had access to the Bank of America branches in London and would go in, repair telephone wiring, wiring for electrics, and standard repairs that were required. And he had the freedom of the bank. And of course, they then found out that he could also go in out of hours with the height of the front door key. In fact, the whole bank's security procedure was questionable. It was a bit uh, ancient and the security system wasn't that good. Well, all they had in those days was just an alarm which they set and everybody went home. If the bank was raided, a, uh, a gramophone record would be triggered that would broadcast to the police. And perhaps it was possible uh, that anybody in the know about that system would just simply locate where it is, lift the needle, and so prevent a broadcast being sent to the police saying that the place was being burgled. The keys in those days were kept in the telephonist's uh, switchboard during the times the bank were open. So it's quite laughable, really. No one would expect the key to the front door to be kept on the switchboard during the day. And if, if somebody told <laughs> the managing director of the bank that that was happening, security today now is everything is buttonholed and screwed down. Yeah, to be true for the security system at the Bank of America was, was virtually non-existent. Full stop. The Bank of America was looking vulnerable to criminal attack. Well, if you've got a criminal mind and you're working and getting the freedom that he's got, which was just unbelievable, really, when, you, when we went into it, um, he must think that there's a way of doing it. That's just criminals, isn't it? It is alleged that whilst having a drink at a pub in South London, Stuart Buckley met with an old criminal associate, Frank Maple. Perhaps over a beer, they discussed Buckley's new job. And it's inevitable that somebody who's working in a bank would prick the ears of somebody who's in the world of, of crime and, and they'd be intrigued. And Buckley explained in all probability that he had keys to two of the major banks in London and in actual fact had free access to these banks. To Maple, this would be like gold dust, it would have been a, you know, a fantastic find. Maple turned around and said, the Bank of America has got a lot of money and it's gonna lose some. Described as the criminal mastermind, Frank Maple from Kingston-upon-Thames in Surrey was a career criminal at the top tier of criminality. Once Frank Maple decided that he was gonna target the Bank of America, his first job, uh, like any good organized uh, criminal, would be to set up a gang. These people would have to be trusted people. He would need to ensure that he got people who uh, had specific skills. But he would still need the inside man. And nearly every big crime that's ever been committed, there's always been an inside person, sometimes intentionally, sometimes some, some loose words they say. But criminals who are looking to commit big crime will, will take advantage of that all the time. It's their living. Stuart Buckley was in a prime position as the ideal inside man. Buckley was pivotal to this heist. His role was to provide information that the average hunter would not be able to get. That, for any organised robbery, is, is absolutely essential. Stuart Buckley gave all the information of how to enter the bank other night, when it was closed, make his way through to the vault, open the vault, go in and clear it out with as much stuff as they could take. That was his role, quite simply. Obviously, the Bank of America was ignorant of the fact that this chap had um, previous convictions. So his, him being given free reign would have been invaluable and made him the perfect inside man. A gang of experienced criminals were put together to organize and carry out the robbery. Jimmy O'Luckman from Kingston-upon-Thames, Frank Maple's neighbor and chief of staff. In an organized criminal gang, a chief of staff is central to the operation. 
He would identify who uh, would be required for the job and to ensure that they would be able to fit the bill and were experts in their field. I think uh, O'Loughlin would look at it because his convictions weren't that serious. But I would think he would see his opportunity in getting himself in with this hierarchy of criminals. Leonard Minchington from Palmer's Green in North London, known as Johnny the Bosch. Minchington, also known as Wild, who was well known in police circles. His nickname was Johnny the Bosch, which every criminal and every police officer um, referred to him because apparently he looked like a German from his prison photographs. Leonard Minchington, uh, who had a number of names and aliases, uh, was nicknamed the King of the Twirls. He was uh, a bloke who had expertise in cracking safes. He got several convictions. He'd been involved in armed robberies, burglaries. A lot of it is a sort of folk myth, but uh, one of the things they said was that he was given two keys for two doors. Uh, he produced a key that opened both doors. He was a professional criminal prepared to do anything that would earn him the, the odd shilling, as they say. Peter Coulson from Southgate in North London, nickname the Lucky Thief. Well, Peter Coulson was a professional criminal, didn't have any conviction as such, never been to prison in his life, but had a big house. Um, when you knew his background, he'd, he'd been a thief since he was a young kid. He was a bit of a playboy, prepared to do any sort of crime to get money. He was just another intriguing character who'd come out of Hoxton. The very fact that he had an unblemished record meant that he was very attractive to anybody setting up a, a, a gang required for a heist. Peter was uh, <clears throat> a very competent thief. He got away with stuff in the past and he made a lot of money. The team of criminals set about planning the Bank of America heist. When Buckley had finished his shift, or perhaps in the morning before he went in, he would go to a, a, a cafe near the Gammon Street branch of the Bank of America. There he would meet Mitchington and O'Loughlin. And over a breakfast, a cup of tea, coffee, they would discuss the plans and the information that he probably learned that day during his work. Stuart Buckley was able to describe in detail the bank's working procedure. And whilst he already had keys to the bank's side door, he did not have keys to the vault area itself where all the money and valuable items were kept. The bank vault door was gated. Beyond the vault gates was the vault door itself. There were two independent dials set into the front of the door. The bank manager had one set of combination numbers and the chief cashier had the second, but neither knew the other's combination. Expert safe cracker Leonard Minchington would have to crack the vault doors combination. But he first needed keys to the vault gate itself, which were kept at the bank's reception. He was the one that supplied the cuttlefish for Buckley when he knocked the keys off the switchboard in the Bank of America in Mayfair to take the impressions of the keys. We worked out that it was essential for him to befriend the receptionist who held the keys to the vault. He had already been given a tin with plasticine, and it was his job to, through sleight of hand, get imprints of those keys. During a conversation with the receptionist, he just managed to knock the vault keys off the table, and as he bent down to pick them up, discreetly pressed both of those keys into the plasticine and got a perfect copy of each key. Having successfully distracted the bank's receptionist and obtained the key's impression, the band of robbers had everything they needed. But little did they know that an underworld informant had alerted Scotland Yard's intelligence branch, C11, that they were planning a major robbery. Upon his release from jail, ex-convict Stuart Buckley had managed to obtain a job as an electrician for the Bank of America in London. However, the bank officials were unaware that Buckley was acting as the inside man for his criminal associates. Jimmy O'Loughlin, Leonard Minchington, 
and Peter Corson, who were planning one of Britain's biggest heists. But the criminal gang were also unaware that surveillance officers from Scotland Yard's intelligence unit C-11 were monitoring their meetings. In those days, the intelligence section worked on major criminals. Sometimes it was because they knew they were involved in crime, and sometimes it was because they were told by somebody that a particular criminal was going to do something in the very near future. And through watching Minchinton, they saw him meet what turned out to be Buckley and O'Loughlin. And the meeting was in a cafe in Cannon Street at the rear of the Bank of America in the city. Unknowingly, the gang continued making plans. With access to the bank, with full knowledge of how the bank operated, the timings, the comings and goings, they encountered one serious problem, and that was how to actually get past the vault itself. They didn't have one essential piece of information, and that was the numbers with which to unlock the vault itself. They could get into the building, but they could not get past the vault without breaking it open. The gang set about researching and obtaining the various specialist equipment they required for the job. They decided that the best way to do this would be to use electromagnetic presses that would be placed onto the two locks on either side, the left and the right lock, and then drill into the mechanism. This would be an incredibly difficult job in itself. And the idea would be then that once they had drilled into the locks, they would be able to use feelers to be able to probe inside the mechanism and carefully pry it open the, the lock and, and, and enable themselves to actually break in. But the criminals would face yet another hurdle in their master plan. The fact that people would be in the computer room beyond the hours and during the time that they would actually be drilling or working at the vault to try and break into it posed a serious threat to this gang. It meant that they would have to have lookouts making sure that they, they were safe and that they were not going to be interrupted. And if they were interrupted, exactly how they would respond to it. And there, obviously, came the danger of violence. The robbers decided to hire additional help. The time was ripe for what they believed was going to be the jackpot of the century. On Friday, the 25th of October, 1974, at 6 p.m., the bank officials locked the vault and closed business for the day. With excitement and anticipation, the robbers entered the Bank of America on Davies Street in Mayfair. With an operation like this, inevitably, there is a window of opportunity to be able to carry out the raid. They know when they can go in to begin, and they know roughly when the security guards are going to be returning, and they have to leave before then. The alarm was quickly disabled. Once the robbers had gone into the vault, this during the nighttime raid, they began drilling. They encountered a serious problem. The thick steel door was virtually impenetrable. It didn't last too long because they realized the drill was getting too hot. They became desperate. They'd cooled it down with Coca-Cola. So it, it wasn't a real concerted uh, effort, otherwise they'd have gone in prepared. What happened with the drill bits is they broke, and when they broke, they began to lose hope they were actually going to achieve the goal. Tempers began to fray. The robbers would have been inevitably very high on adrenaline during the raid, but as the hours ticked by, they would have become disheartened, especially when the drill bits actually broke. That would have been catastrophic for them. The weeks of planning, the months of planning, had led to nothing. The seven-inch thick vault door had foiled them. The raid was a disaster. They decided to abandon the operation and flee. On Monday, the 28th of October, 1974, officials discovered the robbery attempt and immediately alerted the police. It must have been quite an astonishing scene. Apart from anything else, cans of, uh, of, of cola lying on the floor, probably a pool of, of um, the drink itself. And on top of that, broken drill bits still left in the vault door. But astonishingly, the police didn't think the crime was that serious. 
The first attempt was just documented as an attempted burglary. Um, because it wasn't a very strong attempt, it didn't get processed to the intelligence section. Whether it should have done or not, in hindsight, probably it did, but it didn't. Only the more serious crimes get reported because of, <laughs> there's, there's hundreds every day. There was nothing other than the fact it was a bank to bring it to notice. Uh, in hindsight, perhaps it should have been. But the thing was, it ended up just as an attempted uh, offence, and that's how it was left. And so therefore didn't set off a chain reaction that would have actually happened if they had they succeeded. But these robbers were already under Scotland Yard's watchful eye. The intelligence unit uh, had monitored the three people meeting at a cafe in Cannon Street, and that led them to believe that, that in all probability that they were near the, the bank they were planning to raid. And as we know, Cannon Street had a Bank of America exactly on that street. They concentrated their efforts at the city because naturally I would have probably done the same unless somebody's going to tell them exactly what's happened but they haven't got that inner information. They put two and two together and made the wrong conclusion that the robbery was going to be in the Bank of America in the city. With the intelligence unit unaware of the attempted burglary three miles away at the Bank of America branch on Davies Street in Mayfair, the criminal gang had managed to evade arrest. Brazenly, they set about planning a second attempt, but this time they would need more information. Luckily for the criminal gang, no one had suspected inside man Stuart Buckley of his involvement. Instead, he was allowed to carry on working as usual. One of his jobs was to fit some wires above uh, the vault and he had to get access to the ceiling. And as he made his way through a fake ceiling to fit these wires along some pipes and electrical ducting, he managed to drop his screwdriver through the, uh, the polystyrene uh, tile. And as he looked down, whilst up above the vault, he was able to see quite clearly both the dials that uh, required the codes to get access into the vault. Sitting quietly three feet above the two men, sandwiched in the full ceiling, Buckley stared through the small hole as the bank manager and his cashier began dialing. And I believe he put in there some form of magnifying glass, whether it was a lens from a camera or something like this, to magnify it. When they came in the morning and did the various dials, he was able to write it down. As he watched, the locks were released and the door was winched open. It must have been an incredible find for, for Buckley to be in a position concealed from anybody else in the vault, looking down on the actual uh, locks themselves and being able to see how the codes were being put. It must have I been, mean, you know, for any criminal, that must have been a, a fantastic moment, realising firstly he was hidden and secondly he had access to information that nobody else would be able to obtain. And he waited there till the bank closed and he came back down out the front door with a key he'd got or locked it. This was invaluable information to the criminal gang. For most uh, organised gangs, the chance to return to a failed crime would be just an absolute act of madness. But when Buckley returned, spoke to Maple and the others, and explained how he had found a position, a vantage point where he could see these locks, they must have again thought this was manna from heaven. That, for them, allowed them to redraw their whole operation and work out a new way to get into that bank. Finally, their plans were back on track. If he could access the vault, right, and pass that on to his friends to do the robbery, uh, there's a lot of money in it for him. So from that minute on, they had the combination of the safe deposit. Uh, it's just a matter of going in there and doing it. The gang of thieves were finally ready to rob one of the world's largest banks. They were about to make criminal history. But this time they were better prepared. They had hired a team of criminals to help. On Thursday the 24th of April 1975, at 6.05pm, 
Eight men, smartly dressed in business suits, entered the Bank of America in Mayfair. They were about to carry out Britain's biggest heist. It's a posh part of the town. It's, it's a place where businessmen, city workers and so on, will be returning home. And to appear on in Congress, they carried briefcases and sometime after 6 p.m. entered the building. And they had about two to two and a half hours before a security patrol came round to check the bank. Each member of that gang had a specific role. There would be the people who would be involved in bagging the items, there would be the other people involved in watching, for, as look, serving as lookouts. Two watchmen kept an eye on the computer room, the area they were most concerned about because there would still be staff there. They got the combinations numbers that Buckley had given them correct, and they had the vault open within a matter of minutes. And it was a matter of how many safe deposits boxes they could get open. They used the expression caned, which is levered it open, because it takes a while to lever each one. So they managed to get into 79 boxes. And I think there was four or 500 in there. They discovered a treasure trove of money, jewelry, and exceptionally valuable items. They began bagging them, but not everything was going according to plan. During the robbery, as the other members of the gang filled their loot bags, as it were, there were two lookouts who kept an eye on the room where the computer workers were, were carrying out their work. At some point, one of the staff came out to take a break, and the watchman, the lookout, became concerned that he was going to become privy or aware or interrupt the raid itself, and so actually seized him. Suddenly, there was a hostage situation, and tension mounted dramatically. And it was decided um, that they would have to seize the two other people in the computer room to ensure that they were not interrupted at all or the alarm was raised. The nature of the crime had now shifted. They had gone, they'd stepped up a gear. They'd moved from burglary now to robbery. The two watchmen were armed. This fundamentally changed the crime being committed. As soon as hostages became part of the equation, identity became an issue. The robbers who had balaclavas immediately began putting them on to ensure that no one whom they took hostage would be able to identify them if it came down to a parade. They had planned it to that extent, and inevitably they, they, they knew the risk they were taking. Whilst no physical acts of violence were inflicted on the hostages, they were left bound and gagged as the robbers escaped with their haul. They ended up eight million pounds better off. But in actual fact, they left a great deal behind. Uh, it was, to put it mildly, a, 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 a robbery that they had beyond all their dreams. Having stolen the property from the robbery, they then went to an address all pre-arranged, which in those days, and probably still is, referred to as the flop, where they would flop down and do the share out. Inevitably, with a haul of this nature, a variety of different currencies, different types of jewellery, it's impossible to know what value is worth what. So that the actual dividing of it was quite, probably quite tense. What they did was divided it into lots and, uh, as it were, drew st straws to see who got exactly which lot. And that usually is, is a time when, when tempers can fray. Colson, being a bit somewhat thinking he's a bit of a jeweller, he gave cash to the others for what he considered the nicer pieces of jewellery. And of course, so within a few hours of it all happening, everything's divided. Back at the bank's vault, the computer room workers remained bound and gagged. Because of the force used, the offense now became one of robbery, which carried a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. But would the police be able to find the criminals and track down the stolen treasure? Or had the gang managed to get away with Britain's biggest heist? After a failed attempt to rob the Bank of America, inside man Stuart Buckley was able to return to work at the bank without any suspicion. Upon stumbling across a full ceiling directly above the vault, Buckley passed on the vault's combination numbers to his criminal cohorts. 
the robbers returned to the Bank of America for a second time and successfully entered the vault. They raided over 70 safety deposit boxes before they feared their discovery by three computer room workers whom they grabbed and left bound and gagged as they made off with eight million pounds worth of cash and jewels. When a security guard discovered the workers, he quickly raised the alarm. News of the heist was soon making the headlines. This robbery, where eight million pounds was taken, was the biggest at that time. It would have generated a tremendous amount of publicity. Papers would have been all over it, and the television would have covered it to a great extent. It was, in those days as well, particularly in London, it was the bread and butter of tabloid newspapers. It was a mega robbery, and of course, the name that goes with it, Bank of America, you know? They are our favorites, the Yanks, no matter what you say about them. Anything in excess of a million pounds in those days, hell of a lot of money, hell of a lot of money. And then this one, initially, we thought somewhere between eight and 12, then it was eight and 10. In actual fact, how much? One will never know exactly, because who knows what goes into safe deposit boxes, apart from the person that puts it in there. They're the only people that know. Scotland Yard's crime-busting unit, the Flying Squad, were quickly drafted in to investigate the crime. In the 1970s, the Flying Squad had established a robbery division which gave rise to the current Flying Squad model for the investigation into armed robbery in London. Detective Superintendent Bob Robinson was part of the investigation. It wasn't until the next day that uh, the Yard learnt of the breaking into the bank. Detective Constable Reg Leonard was also part of the police investigation. I was one of the chaps who went up there. We set up an office. Um, I would suppose there'd be somewhere in the region of about 20, 25 of us involved in that inquiry. Once a robbery produces a tremendous amount of headlines, there is a great deal of demand from the bosses of the Met to ensure that the robbers are caught. Detective Chief Superintendent in charge of operations at the Flying Squad was Jack Slipper. With a case like this, it went to their best man, and that was uh, Jack Slipper, and nicknamed Slipper of the Yard. Pivotal to the investigation of major robberies, and best known for his pursuit of the great train robber, Ronnie Biggs, Detective Chief Superintendent Jack Slipper cut an imposing figure. Slipper went to C11, which is the intelligence unit, and there he discovered that there was intelligence from a tip-off that some robbers were planning some kind of raid in the city of London at a bank. Very quickly, the intelligence section who had been doing the observations knew that the probability that the Bank of America in Mayfair Street was committed by the people they'd been watching, the Bank of America in the city, there's not too many bank robberies per day, they know that they've got the right people. And it's just a matter of getting the ones they knew quickly. The information that C11 provided Slipper was pivotal. It gave three names, three addresses, and from that information, they were able to work out who they mixed with, where they met, where they had drinks, and who were their friends. Jack Slipper quickly deployed the arrest phase. They started watching O'Loughlin because he was one of those they knew. Um, and they saw, they obviously had an address, and they saw him go to Harrods, buy the suitcases. And when they arrested him, they found in that bag a stash full of money and jewelry and other items that had been seized from the bank. The police quickly identified Stuart Buckley's role in the heist. The information they got from the intelligence unit was that Buckley was one of those seen at the cafe. This immediately flagged him up as the inside man. It meant that they now had the ringleaders of the gang and they were able to start picking them up. Stuart Buckley was quickly arrested and taken to West End Central Police Station for questioning. Well, they denied it initially, but as the evidence piled up, he then told them where 
for he told them who he'd given his share to, to dispose and hide for him. And that was a friend of his who also got arrested. And he, in actual fact, had put it in a plastic stovepipe and buried it in a field down in the country. The flying squad used information of his paltry share to their full advantage. The detectives dealing with, they're not idiots, they quickly showed to him that he had not got a full equal share because they'd got a Laughlin share back to compare it, which he didn't take kindly to. And I think that's what tipped the balance with him. And he then started telling all. What do you want or not? What can I do? Psychology for any detective is a key way to get information from people. While Buckley claimed it was the use of violence, the violence that led him to give the information to police, it may just have been also the fact that they produced in front of him what the other members of the gang got. He um, told police of how he actually was in a position to be able to get the numbers for the, uh, the, the security locks. For 17 hours, he remained cooped up in what must have been incredibly hot right next to heating pipes and confined space in the ceiling. He had uh, taken some sandwiches that he prepared that morning, and he'd also got a, a bottle in which to urinate. He was crammed in there, waiting overnight for the guards to come in, and then for the manager and the assistant manager to come in and unlock the um, uh, locks. You'd done all that. You'd got up in the roof. You'd given the key to the whole thing. You'd given the combination. To say it in a nutshell, he'd been fully cooperative with them, and they'd had him over. With an enormous breakthrough in the investigation, Stuart Buckley was awarded Supergrass status. He would be one of the country's first. A Supergrass is someone who goes against the very gangland or, or the very organized criminal culture that exists amongst criminals. It is a way of setting yourself against them for the rest of your life. They will always hunt you down. We just told everything. He told everything, all his part, how it had come about, and he admitted other crimes. And uh, he agreed that he would give Queen's evidence. In my book, he's a super guy who gives us super information so we can make super arrests. He's a grass, and that is it. He is just an informer, nothing else. The super bit, don't know where it comes from, perhaps the size of a job, something like this. But there's nothing super about them. The crooks. <laughs> the 1970s gave birth to the era of the supergrass and opened a new chapter of criminal investigation in Britain. No criminal had ever before been granted immunity from prosecution or a reduced prison sentence in exchange for giving information. Uh, and they very often uh, are willing to sell their souls uh, to reduce the fine or the sentence. The supergrass would prove to be a great weapon in the battle against organized crime, but there was always the threat of danger to the life of the supergrass. When Buckley became a supergrass, he knew he faced a prison term. That was reduced, but at the same time, he was in an environment where he could be got to. The police would have had to assure him that while he served his prison sentence, that he would be kept safe because he would become a target. Revenge would be high on the priority of those he named. During his time in police custody and as a supergrass, Buckley's privileges would permit him to leave the confines of his cell and be escorted out for his daily exercise. The word had got out, of course, that Buckley was, which he probably had done by that stage, uh, Buckley's life could well have been in danger. So he was escorted out by armed officers, and I was one of those armed officers. I can remember on one occasion taking him out one day, and I took him to a restaurant in Kensington. Uh, a chap came in and I noticed Buckley look at him and he almost went white. So I said, what's the matter? He said, God, he said, that guy that just came in and just sat down over there, you see him? I said, yeah. He said, he looks so much like Peter Coulson. It's unbelievable. I said, you sure it's not him then? So he said, no, no, he said, it's not him. He said, God, he said, just made me jump for a little while. He said, very same build. Facially, he looks the same, the hair, he said, that could have, you know, very, very much like Peter Coulson. 
that's something that uh, stuck in my mind and came in very handy later on. Meanwhile, the Flying Squad was successfully arresting some of the other criminals involved in the heist, including Leonard Minchington. When Minchington was arrested and questioned, he kept them. He refused to say anything. Jack Slipper later recalled how, in actual fact, he just sat there deep in thought, concentrating, probably quite determined. I think uh, Slipper felt he was close to confessing, but they just couldn't crack him. Billy Gear had received a parking ticket, which later helped the police in tracking him down. When we were doing the inquiries, we found out that uh, he'd taken his children to the dentist on the afternoon of the robbery, which necessitated him having to take the car to get there in time. He had double parked after he arrived late for the robbery, and that led police to his door, where they realised, they probably put two and two together and realised that he was a known criminal, and he was at the scene at the time. Billy Gear was arrested along with his wife. He confessed to his part in the heist and returned his share in exchange that the police released his wife as she was never involved. As the police were desperately trying to find and arrest the few outstanding criminals, they discovered that Frank Maple, who they believed had masterminded the whole heist, had left the UK for Spain. Peter Coulson had also evaded capture. Would the flying squad be able to track him down? Or would his reputation as the lucky thief remain intact? Having stolen eight million pounds worth of cash and jewels from the Bank of America, the robbers had managed to make British criminal history. But the flying squad was quickly drafted in to investigate the crime and bring those responsible to justice. Detective Chief Superintendent Jack Slipper headed the operation and quickly made several arrests, including inside man Stuart Buckley, Chief of Staff Jimmy O'Loughlin, and expert safecracker Leonard Minchington. But Peter Coulson was still on the run. He had information uh, from a grasp that Coulson was ringing two girlfriends in North London. Coulson was using a public telephone box somewhere in Knightsbridge, and he was ringing these two women at least two or three times a day, and always between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. So as a result of that information, we covered some 20 telephone kiosks all in that area. And I just went on, oh, 10, 10 or 12 days we were doing that. Very, very boring job. On about the 12th day, or the last day, we're making our way back to the office, back to West End Central, and we're driving past Harrods. As I used to work that area, back in my mind, I had this telephone box. I thought, I don't remember seeing that telephone chaos in the game plan. Just as Reg had thought, the telephone box was there. As he and another police officer called Guy approached the kiosk, they could make out a figure in the phone box. We had information that Coulson was not going to be taken easily, which to us meant he could be armed. And if he was armed, he could be dangerous. As we were approaching the phone box, um, Yes, I was feeling a little bit sort of uh, what the hell am I going to do because I do not remember in my firearms training being taught or given guidance on how to take an armed person out of a telephone box. So I thought, Jesus Christ, Reg, what are you going to do? Make your mind up. Are you going to take this guy out or not? Guy opened the door wide and quick. I dashed forward, grabbed this guy around the neck with my left arm, threw him down on the pavement, took out my 38 Smith & Wesson, stuck it in his ear, and said, Peter Coulson, You're nicked! With Peter Coulson finally caught, the criminals were formally remanded in custody and had to appear before a judge at Marlborough Street Magistrates Court. Well, Lachlan was quite a, a, a savvy chap by the scenes of things. When he was at uh, Marlborough Street Magistrates Court, he appeared up for a remand hearing what happened in those days was that you would join your 
uh, your, your lawyer outside, your barrister, and he handed you papers and your files and explained what was happening before being led to a police van. He was handed his papers, and as he was led away, he, he nipped into a toilet whilst the other members of the group carried on their way to the van. When O'Loughlin returned from the toilet, he was surprised to discover he was alone. With a great deal of gusto, walked confidently the opposite direction back towards the courts. Inevitably, someone involved in a crime like this has to be cocky. They have to be self-assured. They have to be the kind of person who really believes that whatever they do, they can pull off. News of Jimmy O'Loughlin's escape would soon reach the British press, where rumours of police bribery were circulating. Once again, the city, the country's press, were obsessed with this story. And the flying squad had the humiliation of realising that one of the key suspects had just walked out arrogantly, just broken bail and disappeared. The, the pressure on Slipper must have been tremendous. How many times have we got to catch a villain? That little scrotal Lachlan has escaped from court under our bloody noses. A furious Detective Chief Superintendent Jack Slipper decided that he would take matters into his own hands to find Jimmy O'Loughlin and bring him back. What he did was naturally went to the first port of call and he went to um, O'Loughlin's girlfriend who lived in South London. Janet Allen was described as a shrewd and intelligent lady. She was fiercely loyal towards her boyfriend, Jimmy O'Loughlin. Jack Slipper and Detective Chief Inspector Mick O'Leary needed to find out what she knew. He went to the flat, interviewed her, and had that nagging feeling, perhaps that second sense that um, good detectives had, that she wasn't telling the truth. I still don't know where he is. Have a look, Janet. Jack Slipper stressed to her the importance of O'Loughlin handing himself in or facing a life on the run, neither of which was an appealing option for her. It was during their lengthy dialogue that Janet Allen let things slip. You could have persuaded him to give himself up before something really serious happened. I'd probably be able to speak to him before the weekend. Jack Slipper became more and more convinced that Jimmy O'Loughlin was not far away. They left and returned again, this time with a search warrant. He instructed his officers to ransack the property. They went through it, room by room, turning the place upside down, but couldn't find O'Loughlin there. Jack Slipper waited patiently for his men to do a thorough search of the house. I hope we don't cause too much damage. In the end, they went under the stairwell and they found the piles and piles of rubbish jammed in there. And because apparently uh, O'Loughlin had bad smelling feet, one of the officers just couldn't help but notice the smell. And they removed all the rubbish and their cowering underneath the stairwell was O'Loughlin. Gotcha! With all the prisoners now safely in police custody, a trial date was set. On the 16th of November, 1976, eight men were sentenced for their various parts in the Bank of America heist. But the main gang members received the longest sentences. Jimmy O'Loughlin got 17 years. Leonard Minchington was sentenced to 23 years. And Peter Coulson, received 21 years. Supergrass Stuart Buckley was tried separately and received seven years. Guilty. Despite having caught some of the key members of the criminal gang, the police only recovered Stuart Buckley, Jimmy O'Loughlin, and Billy Gear's share of the stolen treasure, totaling a mere 500,000 pounds. <laughs> A staggering seven and a half million pounds still remains missing. It could be said the criminals did get away with one of Britain's biggest heists.